Hi, my name is Raquel, and I ordered fire cell. You have to have the money, the beast, on your mind, or in your hand. It's one of those words they don't translate correctly. They lie about a lot of things because it's too bad this Christians never really learned the truth about Jesus Christ and his message. You know, he told his disciples to go forth without money. But there's the word karagma. And um, the whole context, like no one buys or sells without the money, they don't translate that word right. Other beast on your mind, you're in your hand. There's the Greek English lexicon with the word karagma. It shows you that's the impress on the coin or stamp money coin. And that, like I was telling you, Jesus Christ believed in eliminating money. His, he told his disciples to go forth. He, he even says when money becomes a thing of the past. And um, you can't serve God or money. The Aramaic word mammon means money. And they don't translate that correctly. And if you look at the whole context of Luke 16, then they, they say the Pharisees who loved money, fleraguron, means fondness of silver, hurtless and scoffed. And then there he is, says, carry no gold and silver. And uh, the Essenes were contemporaries of Jesus. And they also didn't carry any money. I'm trying to find, uh, I don't know if I have that in here. Uh, yeah, there it is. In Josephus, he wrote uh, about the Jewish war, which was um, about, anyway, it's kind of like the same time the book of Revelations was written, but the Essenes were contemptuous of wealth and communist perfection. And uh, they carried no baggage at all. And... Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, where does it say? Nothing is bought and sold among themselves. So they didn't uh, carry any money. Anyway, the biggest thing that's been happening, I guess, is this. You know, I told you like last week that I found out about this mass extinction, you know, this global warming, which is better called climate change. We're having all these fluctuations and uh, this polar vortex comes down and like causes cold on the east coast and deceives a lot of people into thinking that, you know, oh gosh, well, yeah, you know, they're so stupid about this global warming. But like, if you look at China and some of these pictures, if you watch the news at all, they show like sometimes in China, you can't even see the sunrise. And I think a couple of weeks ago, I showed you a, a couple of months ago, I showed you a, like a picture of the people in China and they had a huge like, TV screen outside and it showed the sun rising you know the Chinese like to get up early and do exercises in the park if you've ever been like um, to Thailand or China you know the Thailand and, and Bangkok had a lot of um, Chinese people you know kind of Chinese kind of run Indonesia and they kind of run uh, um, Thailand and so they get up early in the park and they had this big TV screen in China where they, since they couldn't see the sunrise, they, they watched it on this giant TV screen outside. But how can we keep thinking that, like, you know, polluting the planet like this? We can't see it, you know. It's all this insane driving we're doing. But it um, really is, I mean, if you go to my web, go to my Facebook page and, um, through my, you can find it on my website there, 666ismoney.com. And um, you'll see my recent Facebook posts where I've found out about this climate change thing. Here it is, this coming planetary emergency where um, it's all because, like, uh, the methane in the Arctic, they're, they're predicting that the whole Arctic will be without any ice, like in 2015. And um, it's the lowest level it's ever been in February before. So, uh, like, if the ice all melts, the ocean will warm up there. And um, because the the white snow and ice reflects the sun, and so that uh, it doesn't absorb, but it also melts the ice. And if there's no ice there, it's going to heat up the oceans. And if the ocean in the Arctic starts warming up, it'll and also the atmosphere up there, like Alaska was like 15 degrees above normal. And um, so um, now this doesn't show it. I wanted they had just the other day they had a 
uh, climate map um, with uh, temperatures for last month and and California had above extreme high temperatures and and Arizona had significant you know it was like second you know to you know breaking records for heat and everything and um, you know I mean there's extremes it's it's not really global warming it's climate change and that polar vortex came down and made the east coast with a lot of snow and a lot of cold but Alaska was like 15 degrees above normal so like if the polar um, warms up the peat moss up there and they have decayed vegetation which you know like in the peat moss and it and then, then there's other like frozen methane I don't know how it got there I, I mean I think maybe you know, I think it was these dead animals in the ocean. They died and went down to the bottom and formed methane, you know, like decaying matter. It turns into methane and it got trapped on the bottom of the ocean somehow. But if the ocean warms up and, these, and the peat moss warms up, then this methane will uh, be released. And methane is like 20 times worse than, uh, than carbon dioxide. And so um, there's... Um, this guy, I got to see him, he was speaking at the Antigone Bookstore, and it's kind of a really big coincidence how I found out about this global warming thing. You know, it's Guy McPherson, he was a professor at the University of Arizona, and uh, I just finished reading this book. It's called uh, Going Dark by Guy, Guy McPherson. He's a professor. He doesn't call himself Dr. Guy R. McPherson or Guy R. McPherson, Ph.D., but he was, he was writing in here that he says like a decade ago, he just wrote this book in, I think it was June 2013, and he said a decade ago he uh, was editing a book on climate change, and he realized that, wow, you know, we've passed a point of no return. You know, the, we've reached a level of 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air and it started out at like 280 in the industrial age and it's already gone up to like 400 and it's just kind of it's not linear it's it's not going up like this it's going up like like this population graph it's like exponential and uh, the, the same with the methane it's starting to really go up and eventually maybe I'll get some some charts and graphs to show this. I have a lot of them on my Facebook page, but you can see how this population is like like doubling over time. And you know, back here in 1776, it was around a billion people, and in 2032, we're going to have like nine billion. And all these people, they want to eat meat, and uh, and the the cows and pigs and sheep and all these other animals produce like. They produce a lot of methane too. They, I've heard they contribute like 20% of the global warming gases. And like I was saying earlier, I mean, you look at China, and you know there the the it's visible. And they were saying that Paris today on the news was um, today is March 14th. They were saying on the news today that Paris had like really bad smog today. And uh, with all these people on the planet and um, burning up fossil fuels. It's just like um, since the industrial age, the, all these chemicals in the air are, are causing global warming. And we're, you know, I mean, it, it's so unique that humans are alive and that, that all these animals are alive. And like there was a, a front page story in the New York Times book review uh, a couple Sundays ago uh, about this book called The Third Extinction. And uh, this was Al Gore was um, he wrote he wrote this book review here, and uh, he, you know he doesn't really you know I mean I, I've known about like global warming or not global warming but the first thing I really found out about was the the population bomb you know when I was growing up my mom had the book by Paul Ehrlich, it was like, I don't remember what year it was, that that came out, 1968 maybe, or around that time, and then a little bit later, maybe in 1973, they had this Club of Rome thing, which um, was the limits to growth, and 
And so I knew, I figured, you know, back when I was going to college and stuff that, you know, we're on an unsustainable uh, path. And even one of our professors talked about it. And he, he said that Japan was like a cigar. It's just consuming, you know, it doesn't really, they import just about a whole, everything, you know, oil and the, about the only thing they, you know, they sow anyway. It's just like unsustainable with um, all the population growing and, and the amount of oil we have, which is a finite resource. And they never figured in this pollution. And I don't know when people started to really become aware of this. I, like uh, in this book by uh, Dr. McPherson, that he, uh, there, you know, there have been studies, but um, I, think, I think they're saying that by 2009, most people knew about it, like Obama knew about it. And it's kind of like the, um, the um, like if an asteroid was going to hit the Earth, would, would people talk about it? Would, would you want to know about it or would you rather just be ignorant and allow it to happen? You know, ignorance is bliss. So, like, I mean, I would kind of like to know when the asteroid's going to come and hit us. And, you know, like Guy McPherson says in here, he'd like to sit there and watch it, you know. Here it comes, you know. But, uh, you know, it's like a lot of people, they, they don't want to hear that. And I put this up on my Facebook page. I just saw this the other day. This woman who co-wrote the um, International Climate Change Report, I forgot, the acronym for it. I, I don't know. I can't remember what it is. It begins with I International Climate Change Report or something, and they've had like five of them. The fifth one is just coming out, and and there's been leaks. You know, leaks. People have been leaking this information out, and um, they're they're um, saying that this um, that it's just unsustainable, and we could have a huge extinction. This woman, yeah, she co-wrote this. And she won the Nobel Peace Prize. The Well, she didn't really win it, but she co-wrote it. You know, I mean, she was like the lead writer of it. So essentially, she kind of won the Nobel Peace Prize along with, um, was it Al Gore, I think? Um, they both won it for climate change. And um, so she was saying that, um, I got a video, I posted it, that, that we're going to become extinct, you know, and... Uh, there, I just like I just found out about this thing, and um, just like a month or so ago. So it's kind of like what Dr. McPherson writes in this book. It's like that Kubler Ross thing, you know. It's you you first don't want to believe it, you know, and then you come to grips with it. Kubler Ross, you know, has her theories about death and the stages of death, and it's um, you go through grieving. My my silly ass cat died. I had a a fluffy white cat that I just loved, and if you follow my photographs, and I put a few of them up, I put them up on Facebook too, but my um, big old fluffy cat, he was about uh, 11 years old, and uh, he, um, I met him, my fluffy cat came to my doorstep, I was coming home from the bars late uh, on a, late at night, like at 2 in the morning, and uh, this little tiny white cat was on my front porch, and it was cold out, you know, it was winter, and so, you know, I couldn't let the little kitty die, so I brought him inside my house, and I think all I had was cream, you know, a half and half for my coffee, so I gave the little cat some cream, and and uh, I think that cat climbed into my bed with me that night. Yeah, he did, because I used to sleep on the floor, and uh, I'm pretty sure he did, so anyway, that little cat of mine, he apparently had a, he caught um, that um, thyroid problem, hyperthyroidism, and I was reading on the internet and about that, uh, they probably think, they think that the cats get it from eating whitefish and salmon and uh, liver, you know, like chicken liver, cat food, and my cat loved those, those were the, like the three he liked the best, so... I'd feed him like a can of that a day for the past four or five years. And I, you know, I imagine that the parts, you know, the liver and all that stuff contains something in there that causes a cat's thyroid to go off. You know, I mean, 
it's like with this Fukushima thing in the Pacific Ocean, I saw this woman speaking at the um, Quaker. She was, at, she was also at this, this meeting at Antigone Bookstore. I can't remember her name, but uh, she was a history uh, professor, and she was talking about Fukushima and how bad it is. You know, all this low-level radiation is a lot worse than they're telling us that it is, especially if it gets inside you, like if you breathe this stuff in. And they're saying that, you know, like when they did those above-ground nuclear tests in the, like the 50s and 60s, that a lot of people that lived downwind of that would get, like, cancer. And, and so, um, anyway, the bottom line is I wouldn't eat any more fish from the Pacific Ocean. And, you know, like, if the, you know, this climate thing, it this um, Dr. McPherson believes that, like, in five years things could get really bad. If if we have like a burst of this methane, you know, there's so much of it up there. There's like gigatons of this methane up in the Arctic. And and if any, if a, just even a tiny bit of this just suddenly melts and goes into the air, it could trigger, a, you know, a, a severe catastrophe. He thinks, McPherson thinks that within five years, that it might become inhabitable, some parts of the um, inland empires of the North Hemisphere. And it won't hit the Southern Hemisphere for a, a few more years later because, um, you know, the methane has to travel all the way down there. And then also, McPherson says that because of the continents and the oceans and all that stuff, it'll so people that are in the Southern Hemisphere will live a few years longer than people in the United States. But it's like, um, you know, I mean, if an asteroid was going to hit this planet, would you want to know about it? And it, it really, you know, it kind of really made me, it's changed me person, personality-wise to know that, you know, we're going to become extinct and like I showed you, they're, they're starting to talk about it in the mainstream paper. This famous book here, it's really, it's been on the bestseller list for a while about the sixth extinction. And like I was saying, you know, Al Gore wrote this. And, but he doesn't really, I don't know if I underlined anything in here. Let me see. Oh, yeah, the Andes, the Amazon rainforest, the Great Barrier Reef, and her backyard. Yeah, she... Um, the person who wrote this book um, went to those places to... I've heard that, like, that Guy McPherson wrote about it in his book here. Um, I don't remember, was it 50% of the Great Barrier Reef has, has already vanished? And it's because the ocean is becoming more acidic. It's the oceans that are really absorbing this, this heat from the sun. And it's... Um, causing acid in, in the ocean for some reason or other. I don't know. I don't quite understand it. But, and it's killing off all this coral. And then it's killing off all the um, plankton and things up in the ocean that the fish live on. And, and so, uh, you know, I mean, uh, if people, you know, it's like this whole thing. It's just the most craziest way thing. But, like, it's just, I, when I first became aware of all these things like like just after high school and um, I had like a spiritual experience and um, I realized that that you know the the way to live would be without money so uh, I mean I had this this conversation with God and God told me that we uh, there won't be any money in the kingdom of heaven you know which kind of makes sense you know there won't be insurance companies and and um, real estate agents and, and bankers and bookkeepers and accountants and sales clerks and salesmen and stockbrokers and funny money, um, all this crazy stuff. And um, so I, you know, I just started uh, thinking about that. And then I started thinking um, about, you know, how this change could come apart, come, become possible or, or whether, um, you know, we're even going to, you know, if God will punish us, you know, uh, for some reason or other. Because back then, you know, I was really a holy and pure person. And, you know, I mean, I didn't lose my virginity till I was pretty old. And so um, back then, I um, 
kind of became like a nun or a priest or something uh, or a shaman and um, you know um, I just tried to f figure out I, I, for some reason or other I suspected that it was going to hit the fan you know there wasn't any salvation you know the people aren't going to wake up kind of like Noah's Ark kind of a thing the mythology behind it that you know people are sinful and God's going to destroy the planet because they're not willing to change, you know, to repent means to change, to change your attitude. And, um, you know, there's, they talk a lot of people in the Bible, you know, the, the prophets like Jonah was, God told Jonah to go prophesy against this city for being wicked and sinful. And Jonah refused to go. And, you know, it's kind of like um, kill the messenger type thing. You know, Jesus Christ, if he even existed, came here to to try to teach people the way to live, you know, he was the way, and the way to live life, and um, he told us, you know, certain, you know, the the gospels, you know, I really like the life of Jesus, you know, a lot, and uh, but Saint Paul is the one who causes the problem with Christianity today, but you know, those four gospels, that's very terse, and uh, you know, if we abolished money. And this culture of consumerism, which is, you know, um, on a finite planet with finite resources, we can't have continuous growth. You know, continuous uncontrolled growth is like a cancer. And, you know, we've been polluting this planet and it just doesn't seem right or natural. I mean, it's really gotten out of hand. I think, um, you know, when we were burning coal, I don't, know how many of you even remember you know it was like when I was born it was kind of like the end of coal but um, it created a lot of soot and like the snow would turn black from all the coal being burnt but uh, I, I can't remember I, I think McPherson mentions it you know when the first person it might have been way back it was way back in the 1870s or something but there was somebody even back then that predicted that all this pollution is going to cause extinction. And it just seems natural, you know. It's like, especially this nuclear stuff, It's nobody even knows what to do with this, this uh, poison, this used fuel which takes so many years to, to become unharmful. And like if we had a severe economic crisis, uh, you know, it's like, um, like Katrina, I mean, yeah, Katrina, you know, if, if if there happened to have been a nuclear power plant in that area that got submerged and, and all the workers fled, you know, and they weren't maintaining the plant, you know, what would happen? That plant would blow up and and create fallout all over the place, just like up at Chernobyl. And so, you know, we've got all these nuclear plants that, like, if any kind of severe economic problem or or even, like, um, ecological problem like a hurricane or a tornado or a tsunami or something caused the nuclear plants somewhere in the United States or in, in like it did in Japan to um, or if we you know even had like 2008 and 2009 a lot of people were thinking um, unlike the um, year 2000 scare you know people thought oh you know all the computers are going to go crazy when the, when it changes to 2000 and it's you know that was that wasn't rational you know it's like if it's not rational then it's really not of god and and jesus was the logos or the logic of god and so i mean you know there's a lot of interesting concepts in the bible but you know it, it was written by men you know i mean you can be God inspired, you know, which, which, how would you describe being God inspired? It's just like, you know, it's something in your heart and it makes you want to do good and, and to, you know, be a shepherd, you know, to, to lead the people, you know, and um, to um, respect the earth. You know, we need a new religion if we're going to, you know, I mean, we could probably, you know, I mean, we could, you know, at least live out the last of our days as we should be, and instead of just, you know, this stupid capitalist consumer stuff, you know, going going to work at a bogus job that doesn't really help anybody and make slaves of people. You know, these people in China that make all these gym shoes, 
They have to uh, build suicide nets at these dormitories where they, they have these people, you know. And uh, so it's like, you know, this whole capitalist thing, it's gotten so ugly. They had this commune in China. This was just in the paper uh, yesterday. And uh, they had a, pay, they had a, a commune there. And, and the Chinese government doesn't like it. I mean, it looks, it looks really great. You know, these, these, these people are living there, and uh, they have all these nice little houses and nice fountain, and they grow their own food, and they've discovered this new path. You know, I mean, they're really practicing true communism, and they uh, consuming fewer resources and, and, and living in harmony, all that. Yet the Chinese government doesn't like it you know they you know they're afraid of uh i don't know what they're afraid of i guess you know if if everybody i mean i don't know why it's just i mean look how wonderful that is and he this guy who does this he wants to open up uh 256 branches around the world which which would be a real good idea he calls it the founder of new oasis it's called new oasis and uh Sounds like a really good idea. The, the new oasis for life. And they have illiterate peasants and big city corporate people. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I like this, the idea of these Buddhist monasteries where you can, you know, it's kind of like having little universities everywhere where you can go and, and meet people who have uh, practiced yoga, you know. And um, I watched Doctrinus Utopia uh, the other day and she had a guest who was a teacher of yoga, and, um, you know, and I tell you, Dr. Nutopia looked so peaceful and happy when she was taking these lessons, you know, you put your feet on the floor and take a deep breath and, you know, stuff like that, and, it, you know, it really works, this meditation, and it'll stop you from having to take uh, anxiety medication, which I've had to do. I've, I, I've always known that, you know, you take some deep breaths and it'll... Uh, calm your blood pressure down, take your blood pressure down. So we should have more um, of these, you know, Doctrinist Newtopia believes that we should have uh, our colleges. And that's essentially what this, these Chinese villages are. You know, they're having, uh, you know, they're growing their own food and they've got their own orchards and I don't know what they do for uh, energy. Oh, here it says marriage, money, supervision and punishment are all proscribed because residents believe that those things impede happiness. So, I mean, that's so true. This is such, sounds like such a wonderful idea. And, um, you know, I mean, Karl Marx believed in eliminating money. You don't, you don't hear too much about that. And um, I've got my gospel of eliminating money that you can look for on my website. My website took a really bad dive in uh, visitors because they used to have this company, it was called uh, something like um, News Now or uh, um, something like that. But anyway, if you put your stories in there or your articles or your photographs, it would the Google search engine would pick them up, you know. So I had my uh, six 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 is money and Mark the Beast stuff up there, and and then people would see those pictures and. And then they'd go to my website, but that company went out of business, and it's become something else now. And uh, so uh, they just completely just got rid of all that stuff. It was called uh, what the heck was it called? Uh, oh, anyway, I don't remember. But so my website took a really bad dive. You know, when I first became aware of this stuff, you know, about eliminating money, and then I became aware of the Kennedy assassination and this Holocaust thing and uh, and some of these other things, I thought that people would, you know, want to know about this. You know, I wanted to tell um, Jackie Onassis. When I first found out about this, I went to, like, New York City, and I went to, I think it was Doubleday Publishers she used to work for, and I went up there. I wanted to visit her, but she wasn't there, and and uh, or maybe she was, but they wouldn't let me in, of course. So, um, anyway, I wanted to tell her that, you know, the CIA killed your husband. And, uh, 
you know, I thought that, you know, you know, when I first found out about the CIA killing JFK, you know, I was, I was doing research at the University of Arizona on, uh, for my gospel of eliminating money. I was trying to find quotations from people who believed in eliminating money. And uh, so I was reading up about Pol Pot, you know, the populist leader of Libya. And uh, he believed in eliminating money. And uh, the Reader's Digest wrote a, a story about, you know, how um, the killing fields and all that. You've heard about that. So, like, anybody who believes in eliminating money gets demonized and slandered. And, um, like, uh, Fidel Castro believed in elim believes in eliminating money. And uh, Muammar Gaddafi believed in eliminating money. And I really like Gaddafi. I, you know, I, I've got a story here. <clears throat> you know, I mean, Libya has really, really gotten bad. You know, and I, I can't imagine what these people are thinking now that live there. You know, they, they want to have their freedom, but it's just become like, you know, what, what do they want for freedom? I think a couple months ago I told you that they had an article like this and they were interviewing some of these so-called revolutionaries and they they wanted McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. It said that right in the New York Times. But um, so, you know, he was another person who believed in eliminating money that got demonized and they killed him. You know, they crucified Gaddafi then they uh, slandered uh, uh, Pol Pot and they slandered Castro, you know, and, and uh, you know, the devil. If you look up the word devil in the dictionary, the Merriam-Webster, you know, see the etymology means to slander. So uh, the devil is illogical and a slanderer. If it's not logical, it's not of God. If it's not logos, then it's not uh, logical. And uh, so, you know, they they mis they misunderstand the. Uh, uh oh, <coughs> dear! <laughs> I went to the bank the other day, and this poor woman behind the counter was sneezing and sneezing and everything. She had like a sneeze attack. It was that day a few days ago here in Tucson. We had like, we've been having the craziest weather down here. Like uh, we haven't had any days where it's frozen. You know, I, I don't think we've had maybe one or two maybe where it's gotten freezing. But um, a couple of years ago, we had a hard freeze that froze the pipes in my house. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it used to do that quite often. I remember I used to, sleep in here in Tucson. I used to have to wear a hat. You know, that's how cold it got at night. But um, it's been so warm down here. Like I was telling you earlier, that here's a map that shows like where the drought is. You know, they, you probably know that in California where all the food's being grown, they, uh, they're having a severe drought. It looks like, uh, yeah, that's a big, big agricultural area. And they grow like... Um, you know, like a lot of all our food out there, and uh, most of the land out here is, you know, where they, you've been through there, they grow the lettuce and uh, stuff like that, but uh, another problem, like I was telling you earlier, is, you know, with the methane, how the cows and pigs create all this methane, and they create, um, uh, you know, greenhouse gases, like 20% of it, but there was an article here about um, how the cows uh, use so much uh, water. And um, they had an article, well, not only that, but they're saying alfalfa grown for Asian cattle is worsening California's drought. Alfalfa takes up a lot of water. And they were saying in here, what is it? Uh, it takes five gallons to produce a head a head of broccoli or three gallons to grow a single tomato. And then, uh, let's see, 80% of the California's water come, goes to agriculture. And then uh, those numbers next to water, uh, 4 million gallons per ton of, of, of beef. 4 million gallons per ton, by contrast. So anyway, it, uh, you know, cows, they require a lot of gallons. Same with, um, well, butter, you know, but anyway, so 
you know, especially horses too. You know, horses eat alfalfa and they, they eat hay. It's kind of funny because today on the freeway, I was watching our local news. Some guy had a trailer full of hay that he was taking to California. I mean, one of those little two-wheel or four-wheel trailers you put behind, you know, your pickup truck he had. And I don't know why he was taking his hay from here to there, you know, and, and waste all that gas, but that's what he was doing. And uh, so it's kind of like, um, you know, the transportation of all this stuff costs a lot of money. It's like you can get a, if you go to the feed store down here to, to buy a sack of corn, which is also called a bushel of corn because it weighs 50 pounds, bushel of corn is 50 pounds, you know, it cost, uh, I don't know what it cost down here, but it, I remember when I used to buy it, it was like $6. It was $6. And then you could go to Iowa, and I did that too. I went to Iowa, I went to New Jersey. You go out east, and you can get this same bushel of corn for uh, like uh, $4, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, the transportation costs... And uh, there's really no substitute for oil. It's like, um, you know, it's, Dr. McPherson talks about hope, and he also talks about hopium, you know, and uh, it's some of these people, you know, they don't want to hear, you know, they don't want to know about the asteroid coming. They, um, their ignorance is bliss, and they don't want to know about this global warming. You know, it's like... Um, you know, if, if uh, you know more people found out about it, you know we could we could probably prolong life on this planet. But then they were also saying that if we stop polluting, if we stop releasing all this sulfur into the air, because the sulfur in the air blocks the sun, then if we didn't have that sun block there, then the Earth climate would immediately raise like 1.1 degrees Celsius, and uh, it doesn't sound like much, but like if that's an average temperature, then you know it fluctuates, and you know it's. Um, I I said to myself many years ago here when I, I've been in Tucson since 1980, and I said to myself that if um, if ever it gets to be 130, I'm out of here, you know. But um, the highest in Phoenix has ever been it was 121, and I think the highest Tucson had was like 118. But I remember, oh, last summer, the electricity went out for like three hours in the afternoon, and it was like 105 degrees out, and it was just, it was just really, really hard. You know, I'm just not used to it anymore. And uh, so it, this Tucson would be like one of the last places I'd want to be if things got really bad, you know, because first of all, we don't have any water. And, um, you know, if we didn't have any electricity to pump this water out and pressurize the pumps and deliver it to us, we'd be in big trouble. You know, some of these cities that have rivers running through, at least they could go down to the river and get a bucket of water for whatever they need it for. But, you know, I mean, just think of all the, you know, how quickly this Tucson would become a cesspool. You know, you wouldn't be able to flush your toilet and... Uh, you know, I mean, where you know, not only that, but there's no food around here. Like, if you lived in the Midwest, you could go to the countryside and get corn and soybeans. And like I was telling you earlier, I used to go to the store, the feed store, and get these bushels of corn. And then I'd go, and uh, there used to be a place here in Tucson that made tofu, and I would get a bushel of uh, soybeans too. And like I mixed the two together, um, like two parts corn to one part soybeans, and I'd I'd grind the corn twice to make a fine flour, and the soybeans I just run through once, and uh, and then you know, boil the soybeans first and throw the corn meal in a little bit later and cook it and boil it you know and throw a little salt in, and uh, it makes a really good food. You eat it with some vitamin C. And I, I lived on that for like a whole year, and I felt really good and strong. You know, cows cows live on uh, on grass, but you know they get fat when they eat corn. And soybeans have 
just you know like um fat in them you know they have that oil in there and the, and the corn has vitamin a but you know you have to trick your body into thinking that this food is better for you than it really is so i eat like um i think like 250 milligrams of vitamin c but you could easily probably get away with like half that so you know, if I was going, I, I'd like to get out of Tucson. That's my goal. I, I'd like to get up and go to Oregon. And, you know, they have that fertile valley there. They've got a lot of rivers. And um, they get a lot more rain up there. <clears throat> so um, what I would do would be try to get, like, five acres up there. And, uh, and I'd stockpile a year's supply of corn and soybeans, which wouldn't cost that much. And so, you know, after a year, I'd feed the corn and soybeans to some goats that I would have or, and some chickens. I want to get some chickens and goats and, you know, just get out of Babylon and, uh, and uh, you know, not have to suffer the hot, hot summers. Maybe I'd come down for the winter, but I don't know how much longer things can go on like this, you know. And uh, I'd hate to get stuck down here in the... You know, it says in the Bible, you know, pray that the, I don't know what they call it, but it, they say pray that the bad things don't happen in the winter so that you don't have to flee. You know, back um, back then they they were always having, you know, catastrophes and famines and pestilence and, uh, you know, grasshoppers, plagues of grasshoppers and things. You know, and they were very close to the earth. They, you know, they grew their things and, you know, for so many years, even in America, the, you know, the majority of people were living in, in the farms. You know, everybody had an acre and and they grew their own food and it wasn't until just recently that we've become urbanized like this and uh, it's just upset the balance of um, the the chemicals in the air you know it's like there's consequences for burning all this fossil fuel and uh, and like you know the, when the dinosaurs lived it was a little bit hotter and uh, so uh, they uh, we're going to create that kind of a climate but if we don't stop all this pollution it's just like so uh, ridiculous you know like Los Angeles I see these pictures on the news now, you know, of all these cars, you know, people driving and these huge traffic jams they have in China. I mean, China is like death on steroids, you know, it's like they're, they're just living such, you know, out of balance lives. There was this movie, I remember, it was called Kwanastatsi, and it was all about, um, I think that it's a Navajo word for being out of balance. And I can't remember when this came out, but it, it might have been over the early 80s or or so. And, uh, you know, it was just showing how out of balance things are. You know, and that's, that's a principle of yoga is to be in balance, you know. Uh, I think alcohol kind of knocks me off balance. It's not a... But, um, you know, it um, kind of numbs your brain and things and... Um, Oh, gosh, you know, it's just like this. I mean, this is what people do here. Look, this this isn't my last article I've got. It's this silly game that some of my Facebook friends play. It's they put a value on this of seven point six billion dollars. It's ridiculous, you know. It's like, why would people play this dumb idiotic game? Why would they waste their time on it? You know, it's kind of like kind of like a. A drug, you know. It's like, why did we go into Afghanistan? It's it's because our leaders know and that you know we it's unsustainable, and and one way to keep the people in check is to have them all drugged out, and uh, you know, like like in Brave New World, they took this soma, this kind of a drug that that numbs you out. I don't know how many people. I think some of the some of the biggest drugs in America or, you know, psychiatric drugs. And so, you know, it's just Karl Marx said that religion is the opiate of the masses and opium is used to 
to kill pain. So it's a stupefier, and uh, you know, religion. I think you know, like I say, it's irrational religion, which is the problem. And like I was showing you that Jesus Christ, you know, in the he was the logos or, or logic of God, but um, you know, they they just you know they don't interpret this stuff, and they don't they don't tell you that you know Jesus Christ um, told his disciples to go forth without money in their purses, you know, this this Pope Francis, you know, St. Francis of Assisi told his disciples to go forth without money. I don't know why I brought this up. You know, I, this Looking Backwards was a very popular book in the turn of the century, like 1880s. And, um, and, and they, in the, oh yeah, I remember why. It's because the, the 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 I don't know what you call it the protagonist in the book uh, go he time travels into the future and in the future they didn't have any money and um, so he comes back and he's telling all his friends and stuff hey you know I time traveled to the future and there wasn't any money and everything was wonderful you know and this whole money thing is really silly and this um, book by Edward Bellamy became like um, the manifesto for the populist party back then. Uh, let's see, Edward Bellamy was born in 1850. And let's see, he wrote this book, uh, oh gosh, uh, I don't know, sometime around 1890, 1888 he wrote it. So, you know, it's like, um, you know, back then, it's such a different world, you know, with this population and, and most of the people living on farms back then. And, uh, you know, back then it took so many hours to produce 100 bushel, bushels of corn. And uh, plus you had to have all these horses and, and all these other things. And today, you know, with modern machinery, we can produce 100 bushels of corn with six man hours. And, uh, you know, we, like I was saying, you can live on corn and soybeans. It makes a really good protein, and I'm a vegetarian, and like uh, eating meat and killing animals. I mean, why? You know, it's like if people had, you know, and then the way they raise these chickens. I was just reading that California passed a new law that requires chickens to have a cage that is like 14 inches wide or something, or maybe 24, but um, so so it's big enough they can spread their wings, and. Um, you know, this factory farms are, are um, really a, a tragedy. And, um, and the way we're living is, is, is unsustainable. But people are just ignorant. And um, ignorance is bliss. And uh, they want to believe these fairy tales of, uh, you know, like, like this confess it to your mouth that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and you'll be saved, which doesn't make any sense at all. You know, I was telling you that this guy, St. Paul, is the one who causes all the problems with this religion. You know, all these religions are very irrational. And um, I'd say probably this Islamic one is the most irrational. You know, you don't have to pray five times a day to God. It's a waste of time. And, um, you know, they were one of these Facebook groups I belong to about stopping Islam, it shows these guys... You know, in Islam, they're like blood. They got these big machete kind of things, and they're they're they got blood. You know, it's like why would God want you to 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 hurt yourself? Oh, anyway, I want to bring this up here. You know, if you like my show and um, and you want to help us out down here, they're going to be giving away this uh, Jeep Cherokee, and you can buy a raffle ticket. You you can for uh, well, you can't. You're not supposed to know the prize. I'm not supposed to show that, but you know, it's uh, Jim Click is going to donate it, and it'll all the money that from from this goes to uh, the um, Tucson. If you buy it from us down here at Access Tucson, and and I'll put up the address of Access Tucson, or you can Google Access Tucson. You can probably buy these through um, the internet, and the drawing is going to be October or November. So anyway, my name is Raquel. In order to buy or sell, 
you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. And I'll see you in a month. Bye.